Do you like making babies? So do all other organisms. But making babies is a complicated process, particularly for organisms like us that use sexual reproduction. In order for us to make babies, we have to make special cells called gametes. These sex cells have male and female versions, such as sperm and egg. This little cell right here with the flagellum is a sperm approaching a very large ovum, which is the fancy name for egg. And the unique combination of genes held inside the nucleus of this sperm and the nucleus of this egg, once combined, will then make a baby with a new combination of genes that has never been seen before. But all of this begs a question. How did the sperm and the egg come to be with these special combinations of genes? That requires a particular way of dividing the nucleus of a cell. Not mitosis, like we previously learned, but meiosis. And that's the subject of this video lecture. Now, meiosis doesn't just happen anywhere. It happens in two very specific places. In ladies, it happens in the ovaries, which are located right here. And in gentlemen, it happens in the testicles, which are right down here. Both of these structures together are known as gonads. And thanks to the hard work of our gonads, both males and females can make many gametes at a time by meiosis. The meiosis occurring in our gonads is very special. Most of the time when cells divide in our body, they divide by mitosis. For example, that's how we get from being one cell big right here to being many cells big, and then even many more cells big, all by mitosis, a division which copies all of the DNA and makes sure that all of the DNA ends up in the daughter cells. That's different in meiosis. When meiosis happens in our testicles or ovaries, it generates sperm or egg that are genetically unique and diverse. None of them look quite the same. What's more, the number of chromosomes changes, because a sperm or an egg only contains half the ingredients for a baby, not a full set of ingredients. For this reason, sperm and egg, as shown in this diagram, usually have a single letter N next to them, representing that they only have one half of the typical number of chromosomes, whereas most of the cells inside our bodies have two N's worth of chromosomes. Same with that first cell that made us up, and same with all the cells inside a baby. So most of the time we've got two copies of every chromosome, one that came from dad and one that came from mom, but in dad's sperm, there's only one set, or one N, and in mom's egg, there's only one set, or one N. When a cell has only one set of chromosomes, and it's represented by one N, it's described as a haploid cell, whereas when it's got two N, it's described as a diploid cell. So, in other words, uh, these gametes right here are considered haploid cells, and that's why they're shown in blue here, uh, delineating the haploid stages of our life cycle, whereas all the rest of the time the cells are diploid and they're dividing by regular old mitosis. Now when we say haploid has half the number of chromosomes, what does that even mean? Well, when I worked in a lab, I had some people extract some white blood cells from my body and take pictures of the chromosomes inside. And that's exactly what this diagram shows. A karyotype is a picture of all the chromosomes found inside a cell. Now they took this from one of my white blood cells, that's one of my regular body cells, and those cells are diploid. As a reminder, di means two, and ploid means set of chromosomes. In this karyotype, you can plainly see that my chromosomes come in pairs. Like, take my chromosomes 1, for instance. It looks like I've got one chromosome 1 right here and another chromosome 1 right here. Maybe this one was from my mom and the other one was from my dad. And that's also true for chromosome 2 and chromosome 3. I've got two of each of those. And all the way down to chromosome 22. And then I've got two sex chromosomes right on the end. I've got an X chromosome right here and a Y chromosome right here, indicating that I'm male. Altogether, I've got 46 chromosomes, and they come in pairs. So a biologist would say, ah, therefore this is a diploid cell. And since it's a diploid human cell, I have the typical number of chromosomes inside a human. So another way you could describe this cell is by saying it is 2n equals 46, or the diploid number of this cell is 46 chromosomes. In other words, 
all of the cells from our very first cell to the last cell on the end of our thumb or the end of our toe. All of those have 46 chromosomes, with the exception of the sperm and the egg. Those ones have only n's worth of chromosomes, so how many would that be? A gametes karyotype would look much more sparse, uh, and it would be described as a haploid karyotype rather than a diploid one. Hap, to me, kind of sounds like half, which makes perfect sense because it's half the number of chromosomes, or n equals 23. You can see this time, I've only got one chromosome 1, one chromosome 2, one chromosome 3, all the way down, and it would seem that there's a Y chromosome, so if this cell right here were a sperm, uh, and it ended up fertilizing an egg, that means that because of this Y chromosome, the baby would end up being a boy. Uh, but still, overall, the total number of chromosomes here is just 23, indicating that this is a gamete and that it's haploid. Now, we just learned that gametes can be genetically diverse, so, you know, one gamete might get this combination of chromosomes, but with mom's chromosome 1, dad's chromosome 5, and a Y chromosome, while another gamete could get this. Dad's chromosome 1, mom's chromosome 5, and meanwhile, for sex chromosome, it might get an X and turn out to be a girl instead. So, the point is, Gametes are haploid because they only have 23 of the chromosomes, and those haploid cells are different from one another depending on which chromosomes ended up inside of them. So how does our body actually go about producing these haploid gametes that are so diverse? That, my friends, is what meiosis is all about. And while meiosis shares some similarities with regular old mitosis, the key differences allow us to create gametes at the end that A, have half the number of chromosomes that were originally inside the parent cell, and also have unique combinations of chromosomes in comparison to each other. Now, meiosis is so darn complicated that it's actually been broken into two parts, logically named meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Luckily, within those, they follow a lot of the same phases that mitosis does, so some parts of this will be familiar, uh, but we're going to talk about key differences along the way, taking each of these phases in turn. It all starts out, predictably enough, with a diploid cell, with its two copies of chromosomes unwound in the form of chromatin in its nucleus. This is known as interphase. Next comes prophase 1. And like in prophase of mitosis, the chromatin condenses into chromosomes, the spindle fibers start to form, and the uh, nuclear envelope is broken down. However, something very unique also happens during prophase 1 of meiosis that doesn't happen during mitosis. Chromosomes cross over. So let's say, for example, you had two chromosomes, one from mom and one from dad. The two chromosomes would approach each other so closely that chunks from one chromosome would actually switch over to the other chromosome and you'd end up with chromosomes that are mostly mom but a little bit dad and vice versa. Now suddenly on a single chromosome you have new combinations of genes. You have some of dad's genes right next to some of mom's genes. Oh man, if Mendel had ever heard of this. He would have been pumped because this is independent assortment at work. Remember, independent assortment said that the big C doesn't necessarily need to go with the big D, and the big B doesn't necessarily need to go with the big C, and you can see that right here. This big B went with this big C, but this big B went with this little C. So the point is, different combinations can be mixed and matched, and that happens thanks to, in part, crossing over during prophase 1 of meiosis. Now, it can't be any pair of chromosomes that cross over. You couldn't have a chromosome 1 cross over with a chromosome 8, because then you might end up with two genes for ears and no genes for a mouth, you know. Uh, but if you have one chromosome 1 exchange with the other chromosome 1, then you'll be safe. Either you'll get dad's version for ears or mom's version for ears. These chromosome pairs have a special name. They're called homologous chromosomes. As you can probably tell from the homo part of this word, these two chromosomes are the same in some way. Specifically, they have genes on them that code for the same traits. 
So just remember, when we're talking about homologous chromosomes crossing over, we're talking about these two guys crossing over, not these two guys. So we keep making our way along. Prophase 1, where crossing over is occurring, you can see these homologous chromosomes and pairs crossing over. Then we get to metaphase 1, where the chromosomes do something else strange. They line up in two lines instead of in one. Because of this special lineup, whole duplicated chromosomes end up getting pulled to either side during anaphase 1 rather than those chromosomes being split down the middle with sister chromatids moving apart, as we learned in mitosis. If whole chromosomes move in either direction, then by the time cytokinesis 1 happens, the resulting daughter cells now only have two, half the number of chromosomes they had before. So this key lineup in two lines in metaphase is what allows this cell to go from diploid to haploid. And not only is this special in that we made some haploid cells, but these two haploid cells are already pretty different from each other. Just look at the chromosomes inside. New combinations of chromosomes. Again, Mendel would have been thrilled, because the goings-on during metaphase 1 of meiosis give away where some of his laws come from. For example, when a cell is lining up its chromosomes in two lines, it could line up, say, these four chromosomes in two different ways. Either both of moms could end up on the right and both of dads end up on the left, or maybe one of dads on the left, one of moms on the right, and then opposite for the other set of homologous chromosomes. Depending on which of these ways they line up, you end up with, say, some gametes that have all dad's genes in them, all mom's genes in them, or a mix of dad's and mom's, or maybe a mix of mom's and then dad's. This is the second cause of independent assortment in our cells during meiosis. Yeah, maybe dad's chromosomes could both go together and mom's chromosomes could both go together, but it could be dad and mom on this way, or it could be mom and dad on this way all depending on how the chromosomes line up during metaphase 1. So the law of independent assortment happens thanks to the lineup of chromosomes at that time. And Mendel would have been even more excited if he then realized that during anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis 1, these pairs of homologous chromosomes are getting pulled away from each other, either in this arrangement or in this arrangement. That accounts for his other law the law of segregation, in this case shown as the separation of chromosomes and the alleles on those chromosomes are also being separated from each other and ending up inside different cells. And thanks to those two laws, by the time we start meiosis 2, we've already got two genetically distinct will-be gametes. Now, they do need to go through one more round of division, and in this case, the now haploid number of chromosomes line up in a single line, just like in mitosis during metaphase 2. And then the sister chromatids are pulled apart into their own unduplicated chromosomes, which are then pulled by the spindle fibers to either side of the cell. That's during anaphase 2. And then lastly, after telophase 2 and cytokinesis, four genetically distinct gametes are made either sperm or egg, and you can see those unduplicated chromosomes inside have very different patternings on them thanks to the independent assortment that resulted from crossing over and the lining up of chromosomes in two lines.